So, um, my last topic of the evening, I'm going to be talking about a subject that is very dear to my heart, and that's monitoring and introspecting of Django applications. Sorry, is my microphone doing okay? Um, so, Django is renowned for having fantastic developer debugging tools. Um, the Django error page remains my favorite error page of any web framework. Um, and any, and the first thing I install when I start a new project is the Django debug toolbar, which makes it fabulously easy to understand exactly what a page is doing, what SQL's being executed, what templates. It's a really fantastic way of developing. There's just one problem. The interesting bugs only happen in production. And if you look at the Django documentation under debug, it says a Boolean that turns off debug mode. Never deploy a site into production with debug turned on. Did you catch that? Never deploy a site into production with debug turned on. Which is all well and good, but it means that when you're in production, all of these beautiful development tools are, are, are gone, and you're staring at this, this sort of blank void of, of errors being swallowed up. So there are two things that you want to know. There's what went wrong and what's going to go wrong. You know, what's the general health of my application? Now, there is at least, there are a few tricks you can use to, to start getting back on top of things. Um, this, for my money, is the most useful two lines of Python code you can put in a project. And this is, um, this, you can find this on the Django Snippets website. It's eight years old now, and it's still one of my favorite, favorite snippets. What, this is a piece of middleware, and what it does is when it, when it catches an exception in your production site, if you're logged in as an admin super user, it returns Django's default technical 500 page. So it's a quick and dirty hack, but if you drop this, this into your stack right now, you'll start getting those 500 error pages again. And this is great because it means when someone hits an error, they can send you a link, you can click on the link, and you can find out what's going on. Um, so that's great as a sort of cheap hack. There are more sophisticated approaches. Uh, at Eventbrite, we use a piece of software called Sentry, which I believe is also out of the Discus stable. Woo! Um, and Sentry is a pretty fantastic way of tracking errors. It's not just an error logger, it also um, groups errors together. So you get interfaces like this. This is a status screen. Um, you can't see it, there's a 10 there, but the gray's washed out. Um, but this shows you not only the errors you've had recently, but it groups them together. I think it does this by hashing the, by doing an MD5 hash of the traceback. So it can identify when an error is the same error. And it'll say, hey, you've got 44 of these errors recently. Um, you've had 10 of these errors, four of these errors. You can mark an error as resolved. So in this case, somebody's gone in and fixed the bug and said, yep, we fixed this one. But generally, it means that all of your, well, once you have this set up, and there's a fair amount of maintenance involved, you know, it's, you can have quite a lot of database traffic produced by this. But the amount of insight it gives you into what's broken in your app is, is invaluable. Um, for each error, you get a page with the exception and a stack trace, a bunch of extra information, and a URL that you can send around to your team. So it makes it much easier to collaborate on, on errors that are occurring as well. So I'm a huge fan of, um, I'm a huge fan of, of Sentry as a way of getting back that sort of debug level of, of information about what's happening when your app goes wrong. But what about keeping your application healthy? Well, two tools that we've leaned on very heavily at Django and now um, at Lanyard and now at Eventbrite as well are StatsD and Graphite. Um, these are tools, uh, StatsD came out of Etsy, and essentially they're mechanisms for very inexpensively keeping track of how long things are taking and how often different things are happening. So StatsD is a really neat little piece of software. It's actually a node.js daemon that runs on your application server and listens on UDP, which I spelt UDF. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> listens on UDP, which, and UDP is a non-reliable network algorithm. So if the server goes away and your application's chucking stuff at it, it doesn't matter. It keeps on working. You don't have to worry about an error in your, so in your monitoring software taking down the rest of your platform. Um, and your application can send it three things. You can send it timers saying, it just took me this long to render a page or this long to make an HTTP request. You can send it counters. So I've, served, I've, served a, an AP, I've done an API key authentication. And you can send gauges. And does anyone here use StatsD gauges? Discus at the back. Um, what do you use gauges for? Uh, basically, how many things are actively happening right now? So this is a discrete number. 
Yeah, a gauge is it's just a number, and so you can get a graph of, you can just say five, five, three, three, five, and get a, a graph of that. Um, so what, so stats, it sits there, it collects all of this stuff, it aggregates the stats together, and every 10 seconds or, or so, it sends them over to Graphite. And then Graphite is a piece of software that stores the information that stats is sending it, and renders graphs. It renders graphs on demand, and you can get some really useful results out of it. So this is my favorite um, graph from our lanyard graphite setup. This is, and you can't quite make out the key at the bottom, but this is a stacked graph showing the overall time it is taking to serve requests, and then breaking it down by the blue is time we spend in SQL, the yellow is CPU clock time, that tiny little red line along the top is solar, and then if we zoom right in, you can see that blue, that purple line right at the bottom is our is in, is interactions with memcache. So either memcache is running really fast, or we're not using it nearly enough. Um, but this graph here is it's dynamic. It's dynamically generated. We feed a bunch of numbers in, and the actual image itself is just one whopping huge URL, which specifies which things should be d um, drawn on it in which colors. And because it's just a URL, you can take that and you can embed it on anything. You can build dashboards very easily. You can embed it in bug reports. You can embed it in wiki pages. Um, it, it's a very flexible way of, of moving this data around. Um, and so here's a dashboard. Um, Basically, once you have Graphite and StatsD in, because it's so cheap to send metrics out, you may as well graph all of the things. And this is, um, we've got met time in memcache, SQL time, Redis time, time spent in databases. You can do um, means, you can do top 90th percentiles. You can get a really good breakdown of how things are, are going in your stack. And um, we've also set it up so there's a key there that says deploy. When we deploy the site, it draws a white line on the graph. So you can deploy the site and then look at it five minutes later and see, hey, look, our memcached usage just went up by 5% after that change that we've pushed out. But to get this stuff working, you have to, you have to, you have to um, hook this into all sorts of different places. And in Django terms, this means you need to intercept basically everything. Um, this also means you have to monkey patch things sometimes um, if they don't provide you with a good hook. Now, the obvious thing here might be to use Django's triggers and listen for events and graph those. But that's not quite good enough because a lot of the value from StatsD is in the timings, knowing how long something took. And if you're going to time something, you really need to wrap a have your own function called so you can start a timer at the beginning, run the, run the operation, and then stop the timer at the end. So you end up having to wrap an awful lot of things. There are a bunch of ways that you can wrap things things in Django. The obvious one is uh, response and ex exception middleware. And in fact, I looked at the Lanyard uh, middleware stack. We've got at least four middlewares now which are devoted to profiling or monitoring or introspection in some way. Um, I always use a custom render function. So whenever I render a template, I'm calling, I'm doing from common import render and passing in a request object, the template in the context. This gives you hooks for um, hooking up graphite, but it also means that you can inject extra variables into your context. You've got somewhere that, that ev some, a function that's run every time you render any HTML at all. A really important one is the database wrapper in Django. You can override the cursor method on it, so every time a SQL statement is executed by the ORM, you've got an opportunity to get in there, to time it at the start, to time it at the end, to send it off to Graphite as well. And I'll put up a, a, a gist later on with the code that we use for doing that. And um, something which I haven't done, but I aspire to do, is I want to wrap, I want to send all of my outgoing HTTP traffic through a single point within our stack so that we can measure things like, um, so anytime we're calling out to an API, the GitHub API, the LinkedIn API, or whatever, we can graph that, we can graph it by host, we can get a feeling for how those external dependencies that our site relies on are working as well. So that's Graphite and StatsD, and that will gain you an enormous amount of insight into what's going on. It's not as cheap as building feature flags, yet there are quite a few running parts of this. You need to set up a Graphite machine somewhere. You need to get um, StatsD rolled out onto all of your individual boxes. But again, it will repay you enormously if you spend the time to get it sent, set up. So another principle which I firmly believe in is that log files are super important. And once you're generating log files, you, want, you need to have them aggregated and make them searchable. So mo most stacks will have something that's syslogging or sending, sending log files to a central server. Uh, if you haven't got one of those, that's, again, totally worth doing. Um, but the tools I'm getting excited about um, more recently are tools that, make, that take those logs and turn them into something that's more searchable than just running grep on the command line. Um, there are two tools I've been playing with recently. This is Splunk 
which is a viciously expensive commercial tool. Like, very much call, call us and we'll give you a price and then you argue with us and spend months negotiating, whatever. But what it does is absolutely awesome. Once you've got Splunk set up, you can feed any log file into it. It gives you a mini micro language for breaking that log file up into fields. And then when you run a search, it starts returning results instantly. So you'll run the search, you'll hit enter. It'll show you results from the past five minutes worth of logs, which is enough for you to start seeing if you've asked the right question. And then it'll slowly backfill 10 minutes, 15 minutes, up to, up to 30 days and fill in those results for you. So that, it's def it, there is a free demo. It's, if, you, if you've got a budget, it's worth installing it and playing with it and seeing if you think it could work for you. Um, there is an open source alternative to, Slug, uh, to Splunk. It's called um, Logstash, which is a, lo Logstash does aggregation and searching of logs using Elasticsearch. Kibana is a open source UI that sits on the top and does pretty much exactly the same thing as Splunk. Um, you do have to, it's, very, it's a case of patching together a bunch of open source things to get it working, but you can get very much the same results. This is worth looking to, into as well. Um, another technique that we use at Eventbrite, which has proved extremely useful, is correlation IDs. And as Andrew mentioned earlier, we've been breaking Eventbrite down into a service-oriented architecture. So rather than having one monolithic application, we're breaking out functionality into services that know about events, services that know about authentication, and so forth. Now, a downside of doing this is that, there's a, that, that any request that comes into your stack is now being handled by a bunch of Different, um, different pieces of software. So tracking errors and behavior can be, a lot more, can, be, can be a lot harder. And so what we do is any request that's coming in, we assign a correlation ID, which is essentially a UUID attached to that specific request. Um, it goes through the application server, get logs, gets logged out in a log file. Um, it goes into the application calls a service. That service will then log out what it's doing and that same correlation ID. It goes into another service, we get another, another log entry. Now, on its own, this is kind of useful, but when you start feeding these into Splunk or Logstash, it means that given a single request ID, you can throw it in and you can see entries from all of the log files from all of the services that touch that request, which makes it much easier to track down problems. And in fact, you can go a step further. A trick we used on Lanyard is um, we take our, correlate, our request IDs, our correlation IDs, and we embed them in a meta tag on every HTML page. This is another benefit of having this single render method that everything passes through. And that's useful because now that it's available in the source code, if something goes wrong, you can view source, pull that out, and use it to search your, your, your logs. Um, but we also uh, have a very lightweight in-browser profiling tool, which is a bookmarklet, which can take that correlation ID, make an AJAX call back to back to our service and pull out some data that was collected during the processing of that request. We actually built this quite early on at Lanyard, and all it does is collect up information about which view functions were called, potentially which templates we use, and write it into a memcached key which lasts for 60 seconds. So if you hit the bookmarklet within 60 seconds of loading the page, you get that information dumped out straight at you. And um, again, it's a pretty lightweight trick, but it's, uh, it's really useful. A related trick, which is, again, really useful in these larger scale sites, is to instrument your SQL queries. And it turns out, on, with my, MySQL or Postgres, there's a really tri easy trick here. You just stick a comment at the beginning of any SQL query you execute with a correlation ID or other information gathered from the request. So with Lanyard, we track the request.path. We, um, we have our, our custom uh, curse.execute method. We look up the request.path in a glo global request object, and we stick that in, which means that when we're, if we're watching logs of SQL files, or if we're looking at our slow query log, we can tell exactly what page caused a query to be executed. Likewise, uh, we do the same thing for management commands. So if you're not in a sort of browser request context, um, but you were run by a managed command, we log the command line arguments from that in the SQL query as well. So over time, our, our slow query logs become a really, it becomes really easy to track behavior from those back to, the, um, back to the source. And likewise, if you're using correlation IDs, you can drop those into the query logs as well. So when you pull up the slow query log and see something took a long time, you can then consult your log files and see exactly what was going on when that, when that query was triggered. Really, I think the conclusion here is that no one ever hit a bug and said, I wish I had less information to help figure out what's going on here. Um, the most interesting bugs are the ones that happen in production when you've got a lo fully loaded database, you've got lots of traffic going and lots of things happening. Um, you need to, if, if you want to know what's going on in the general health of your stack, 
Um, Stats and Graphite are fantastically useful for that. And you should log everything. Your logs should be as detailed as possible. You should aggregate them, and you should make them searchable as well. So thank you very much.